Life was long and the days were wide I never really thought much about time Sitting on the couch eating apple pie Till I woke up after a week went by All right, so love casts a long shadow. What does that even mean? I, right after I wrote the song, I tried explaining that to somebody that asked me, and it was just did not work out. It's kind of a difficult metaphor to explain. So now that I have two hours to talk, I'm gonna. I'm just kidding. Um, no. So I found this. Uh, I was kind of focusing on miracles when I was thinking about this week. Um, so I looked up online uh, some good um, passages from the Bible that were on miracles, and I found this one that I thought was appropriate for what I wanted to talk about today. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. 
It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. So, the blind teenager. And this is a metaphor, but um, I think I'm probably not completely alone in this, but when I was a kid, you know, you experience a lot of joy and bliss, and a lot of things are new, but you also are not aware of a lot of things about the way the world works. So, um, you know, growing up as, you know, a white privileged kid in Nebraska, I wasn't really um, exposed or noticing a lot of suffering in the world around me. When I was a small child, you know, and I think everybody, as they grow up, grow up, some unfortunately at younger ages than others are exposed to suffering and tragedy. And so, um, you know, when I was a teenager, actually at the church that I mentioned, um, Horizons, I'd gone all the way through confirmation when I was 13. And I had an older sister that was like, from a young age, she was an outspoken atheist. <laughs> she was like, God does not exist. Just look at what they're doing up there. It's a cult. It's a cult. Look at that, you know? So this is like her whispering in my ear. And then, you know, at school, I was taught that, you know, science and spirituality are completely separate things. So you can't have one without the other. And uh, so I, I went through confirmation, you know, I went to church every Sunday. I got to the end of it and, you know, I just didn't feel the oath that I was asked to take, that Jesus is my savior and that, you know, I'm giving my life up for him to serve him and his way because of those things that I just mentioned. I thought that, you know, I hadn't noticed a lot of pain and suffering, and I also ha hadn't seen a lot of things as miracles. A lot of that is because I saw science and spirituality as different. And so if I saw a flower bloom, I would just say, oh, science. <laughs> but the older I got and uh, the more I knew the world, I thought, I realized that science, although it's really good at explaining how things work and, you know, what is happening on a certain level, it doesn't really tell us anything about why what is happening is happening. And so even, even evolution, something that I'm not saying evolution on record, I'm not saying evolution does not exist, okay? I believe evolution exists. I believe natural selection exists, but for a wing to be created, not just one wing, but two wings, something would have to mutate hundreds of different ways, all at the same time in a non-lethal way to occur. And it's no doubt that once that does occur, that something's gonna be chosen, but the Earth, at 4.5 billion years old is old. But when you really think about it, do you think it is old enough for not only a wing to be created, but life to be created and love to be created, for flowers to bloom? It just seemed like at that point when I started thinking about those things, I realized that Yes, the universe is evolving, but it's not separate from God. It's with God, and it's in a way that the universe wants to become better than it was. You know, new cures, new medicines, new understandings, new advancements in civil rights, all these things are evolutions of the universe, and we're constantly growing and getting better. Anyways, let's see what I have next here. The waking heart. So that was kind of the foundation of me becoming a spiritual person. I started reading a lot, a lot of books and all these different religions about, you know, and all of them centered around love and compassion. And um, because I grew up in Christianity um, and I live in a Western civilization society, I, I chose to go with Christianity and, and and the beautiful thing about life is that we have a choice to choose to believe in God or choose not to believe in God. We have a choice to believe in love or not to believe in love. And at the end of the day, 
Science can show you how something works, but it can't tell you why. So you have to decide for yourself. You have to write that manual. And so I decided that I wanted to believe in love because why would you not if you have the choice, right? Um, so I developed a really strong, strong spiritual foundation over the last 10 years or so. And, you know, I met my wife in this happenstance sort of way while I was street performing on the promenade. You know, I got to witness my first child being born, which there's no, no experience like that in the entire universe, you know? Like, that just, either of those experiences is just proof to me, like, in my mind, that love exists and there must be a God out there. But, um, so the waking heart. So all this happened, and one morning last April, I went out for a jog around the school across the street from my house. Um, when I was 21, I'd had my aortic valve replaced, and uh, that valve, I had no idea that it was starting to calcify and wear out. And so I went around the block for a jog. I thought, boy, man, I'm really winded. I, I didn't work out much this winter. I better, uh, man, I would love to just lay down on the sidewalk right here. But if I did, people would probably think I'm dead. So I should just make it the extra 100 feet into my front door. So that's what I did. I got inside, and I was like, oh, I can't wait to, wait to lay down on the couch. And my wife heard me come in, and she asked me if I wanted a glass of water. I said, yes, please. I laid down. I thought to myself, man, I'm so tired. I wonder what, if dying feels like falling asleep. And, uh, sorry. Just a moment. This is where it gets emotional. But uh, it feels a lot like that, at least in my situation. Sorry, give me just a moment. I know this is eating into the sermon time. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so I woke up six days later and was told everything that had happened in that time. This happened on a Monday, and I first came back to consciousness on Saturday night. And the moment I woke up, I just looked around the room and... You know, there were flowers everywhere, um, and I just felt this huge, overwhelming sense of love, grace, and I knew I was going to be okay at that point. I knew that the love of my family and my neighbors... excuse me, had carried me through when I couldn't. So, um, so immediately, you know, the first things I thought of was I started asking all these questions. Like, you know, the first question I didn't ask was, why did this happen to me? It was, why did this happen to me? Why am I so lucky? How did I make it through this? How am I sitting here looking around the room right now? And it's not fair. There's so many children in the world and people that don't get that second chance and aren't as lucky. So I started thinking about, you know, what is a miracle? You know, it's, um, you know, I, I, a miracle is something that you wonder at and something that you can't explain. And there's no great reason that you, that it happened the way it did. But, um, but that's just the nature of unconditional love. And that's, what God's love is for all of us all the time, which is just amazing. Um, so I woke up, and, you know, I started going through all these questions and doubt and worry and thinking, why, you know, why did I not experience any, anything? I didn't have an out-of-body experience where I, you know, watched my wife giving me CPR and learning how to do it from the 911 responder over the phone. 
I didn't see all of the first responders come and get me to the hospital or the surgeon that, you know, had this life-saving surgery on a what seemingly was a dead body, you know. And then I woke up and four months later, the stroke that I had had down the left side of my body, the vision that had gone away and my paralyzed vocal cord were just gone. So this is like, there's, there's little miracles that you see and then there's big miracle, <laughs> miracles. To me, this is a, a huge miracle, but really, when you think about it, every single thing, every time you get in a car and make it to your destination is a miracle. Every time you cross the street is a miracle. And, um, and so I was just overwhelmed by gratefulness. I don't know why I got this miracle and somebody else that is equally deserving didn't. But just like unconditional love is outside of our understanding, I, you know, what happened to me was. And what's interesting too, I realized this morning when I was looking up, I was like, okay, I should probably know if I'm going to talk for two hours about, no, just kidding, about miracles. Um, I should like know really what the word means, you know? So I looked it up and it said, you know, a miracle is something that you wonder at. And it's an event that's manifested by God, right? And so I was like, man, well, if this is a miracle, what is the opposite of a miracle? Like something that you can't explain that happens for no reason, a child dying, anything like that. How do you, what's the antonym for a miracle? And I looked it up, and the only thing that was in the thesaurus for it was normalcy or usualness, which that doesn't seem like the opposite of a miracle to me, does it to you guys? I mean, so then that made me think, wow, well, that would imply that if there's only one word for this thing that we cannot explain, then that word has to be the definition for when something bad happens as well. So there's good miracles and there's bad miracles. But the amazing thing about life is that we choose to associate a positive meaning with the word miracle. We choose to think of miracles as amazing good things. And when something that we can't explain happens that's horrible, we don't call it a miracle. We say that's wrong, that's not right, that's a tragedy, and we can't explain it. And I think it's good that there's no word for that because as humans and as, as people that believe the universe is growing and creating into something better all the time, we refuse to believe and accept that. And I think that, you know, the story of Jesus is the perfect ending to that idea and belief of miracles. Because when you think about what happened to Jesus and why everyone is so happy on Easter, it's because death is the ultimate thing that you cannot explain. It's the ultimate Thing that you say, I don't know, it just doesn't make sense. I can't, it doesn't add up in my head. And so our entire lives as people, we worry about it, we think about it, we say, I just, I can't, it's hard to prepare myself for that because I, I just don't feel like that can be it. And I think that's okay. And so what happened in the Bible with Jesus dying and then coming back to life, that's the final proof that love does win and that, you know, there, there is goodness in the universe. And God's plan, although he's making good and bad miracles all the time, his ultimate plan, as proven by his only son, is that miracles in a positive way exist and are our destiny And this mind, body, and spirit slide, that just goes back to if we know that that's true. When I woke up and 
didn't know what happened to me, and so I'm not any closer to knowing what happens after we die, you know? My soul might not have left my body. Who knows what comes after? But what it felt like to me was my soul just getting recycled back into this universal consciousness that was this deep sleep that felt absolutely nothing. No pain, nothing. But it wasn't a negative feeling. It was just timeless. And um, when I woke up, the thing that I was most grateful for was the opportunity that we have as people to experience anything at all. Suffering, joy, all of it. Just the opportunity for us to feel anything and to spend time with others, with our neighbors, to love each other, to have individual personalities that have the ability through mind, body, and spirit to evolve and make the world a better place. Every person is unique and has the ability to create something new. Every time I sit down and write a song that wasn't there before, that's a perfect example. Every time a, the surgeon walks in and he has all the science, he's the one that writes the manual for actually making it work out. He's the one that's doing that. And, and it's the same with every one of you, whatever your personal experience, whatever your, your job is, whatever your passion is, whatever your heart tells you you should be doing is what that is. So let's see. So love casts a long shadow. What that means for me is that we have this amazing opportunity in life to create, I just, in my mind, I picture this beautiful apple tree that's like, <laughs> kind of like on a, on a hill or something. <laughs> and that's what we're creating as people and a world. And, uh, and that's a pretty amazing thing. So whatever happens, whatever shadow is cast by God across that tree is gonna be a very large shadow. And it's, a very, it's very big shoes to fill. But through my faith, I know that the universe has only ever gotten better and expanded. So whatever it is that comes for us after we do die is going to be even better. And it's going to be one step beyond what we've even experienced. So love casts a long shadow. We are blessed with not knowing what is next. But we do, while we're alive, we have the choice to choose and move the universe in the direction that we would like it to go. So that is the end of my message. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Amen.